what's going on everybody this is john j gaming on the mic here coming at you with a brand new episode of the ncsl dynasty here on ncaa 14 and also featuring that college football revamp as well we have a very exciting episode here we are going into the off season here in year number three of the ncsl dynasty and we have a very exciting one as we've had the opportunity to see the first ever 12 team playoff in the previous episode one that culminates in ucla winning their first national championship here in this series that being said we have another fun one here tonight we're going to take a little re quick recap of what happened in those college football playoffs that saw 12 teams getting in for the very first time. But we also have award winners, both for the Heisman Trophy as well as for the other awards. All Americans who were all Americans as well. And of course, we have the stat leaders, coach changes, so much more in here number three. So I hope you guys are excited for this one. I certainly am. If you're excited for it as well, I need you to do me a couple of things. Go ahead and hit that like button. Hit subscribe as well if you do have to be brand new to the channel. And without further ado, let's go ahead and dive right into this one. Alright guys, so this was how UCLA was able to get to that national championship, but they didn't get the pleasure of having that first round bye. However, what they did do is take care of business all along the way. UCLA starts its playoff by blowing out the Mountain West champions in Colorado, 57-14, then blowing out Florida State to go with that too, and to round out the tournament, they took down the main cinderella in old miss before finally slowing down that texas offense when it mattered the most and that's how they claimed that national championship also again shout out to old miss getting from all the way from the first round outside the top four seeds to the semi-final they are going to be the biggest cinderella in my mind here in year number three but now let's go into the individual players that certainly deserve to be recognized over the course of year number three and also on top of that need to be recognized for their athletic prowess we're going to start with the greatest trophy in all of college football that heisman trophy the winner of the heisman trophy this year going to the quarterback out of clemson Kayasuke Nakamura, and he is one of your guys' custom players as well. The junior out of Jasmine Estates, Florida, he has a year of eligibility left, so it'll be interesting to see if he ends up opting to declare for the NFL draft after this year. He certainly has quite a hill to stand on as he had an excellent season. 3,200 passing yards, 25 touchdowns, and 9 interceptions. Not too bad, right? wait until you see his rushing numbers he also had nearly a thousand yards on the ground as well 18 rushing touchdowns to go with it so he had more than 40 total touchdowns on the year so nakamura definitely deserved that heisman trophy he helped carry the clemson tigers to a very successful season of our Heisman finalists that were in the pitcher ultimately was Trey Dixon, the senior out of Texas. The running back out of Canyon Wake, Texas, had 1,800 yards and 20 touchdowns on the ground, but it certainly was not enough. Marcus Amos finishes in third place. The senior redshirt out of East Brandonton, Florida, the six foot two, 206 pound scrambler playing for those Miami Hurricanes he finishes in third place but he does end up collecting a couple of awards in his own right he does end up winning the Maxwell Award and then also winning the Walter Camp Award as well Amos finished the year with 3,500 yards passing and on top of that also finishing with nearly 700 yards on the ground he ended up with 10 rushing touchdowns and 29 passing touchdowns as well for a touchdown to interception ratio of 39 to 12 so a great season for marcus amos 
could not lead them into the college football playoff, but does finish with a great year uh, by beating Hawaii 21 to 7. In fourth place is another one of your custom players, though. It is Fred Morris the fourth. Fred Morris the fourth, a true senior out of Bloomfield, Michigan, the hometown kid. Well, it doesn't end up bringing the Heisman Trophy nor a Big Ten championship. He will be taking home some other hardware. The O'Brien Award going to the best quarterback in the country. And while it was very close between Kaisuke Nakamura and this kid right here, the senior custom player was the best passer in the country. 40 touchdowns, nearly 4,000 yards passing as well. A completion percentage of close to 67% as well. And he could run the ball too. 550 yards and 6 touchdowns on the ground. FM4 was certainly a complete player. And then rounding out your group, a true freshman out of Miami. It is Caleb Kirk. The true freshman out of Aladucia, Alabama, not only was a starter from day one, but was a game changer for the Miami Hurricanes, at least offensively, good enough for him to be recognized as the Doak Walker Award winner as well. He finishes his very first season of college football with nearly 1,700 yards rushing, 14 touchdowns on the ground, and to tack on to that, he also had over 500 receiving yards plus four reception touchdowns as well. A complete player in the making for Caleb Kirk. It's going to be very interesting to see how his college career ends up progressing, especially if he could remain healthy as well. But even though we did end up seeing some of the award winners already, let's go ahead and check out some of the other award winners that we didn't get a chance to talk about. We got Marcus Amos that was here as the winner of the Maxwell Award. Uh, but we do also have Benjamin Williams here, who is very close to winning the award as well. 39 total touchdowns. He was a great addition as a grand transfer from Delaware. Uh, Benjamin Williams did lead USF not only to a bowl game, but also to a bowl win as well. So you love to see that. Nakamura finishes in fourth for the Maxwell. And then Fred Morris the fourth also finishes in fifth place for this Maxwell Award as well. As for the Walter Camp, we do see Marcus Amos bring home that uh, title as well. Caleb Kirk was very close to winning it, though, as a true freshman. And he also has the Doak Walker Award as well. So already recognized as one of the best players in the entire country. Benjamin Williams, again, the transfer out of Delaware is on here uh, in fourth place. Nakamura is in fifth. And then Fred Morris the fourth finishes in ninth uh, for the Walter Camp Award. Now, going to the Benrick Award, it goes to one of the best uh, defensive linemen in the, actually, just in general, one of the best defensive players in the country. Uh, going to a true sophomore, Paul Moore. He's a sophomore out of Cushing, Oklahoma. The true sophomore played for the USC Trojans and was a menace to opposing offensive linemen out in the West Coast specifically. Paul Moore finished the year with 71 tackles. 28 TFLs as well and double digit sacks. I'm sure he will improve tremendously over the offseason. But Paul Moore, he certainly plays significantly higher than what his overall suggests. He's certainly better than a 79. Now, for the Nagurski Award, that goes to one of the best defensive linemen in the country. And that is going to go to John Washington, the senior out of Notre Dame. The Red Hill South Carolina product was someone that definitely deserves some NFL looks for sure. He might be a fringe NFL prospect, but he was certainly a great college player, cultivating his senior season with nearly 80 tackles 36 tackles behind the line of scrimmage itself a defensive touchdown and of course 15 sacks to go with it too this is not the only award that i believe that he's going to come out with uh so we'll see if he wins any other awards but uh this is a guy that absolutely was a certified bad man 
Now, for the O'Brien Award, that does go to Fred Morris IV, and he was also a Heisman finalist as well. A couple of other players to know, Benjamin Williams, the grand transfer out of Delaware, was in this race as well. He finishes in seventh place. And then Kaisuke Nakamura finishes in a 40 O'Brien Award, which does go to the best quarterback in the entire country. For the Doak Walker Award, that does go to Caleb Kirk, who does end up winning it as a true freshman, beating out a bunch of impressive juniors and seniors that are on this list as well. As for the Belenikov, a guy that comes from a pretty small school, but this guy definitely earned it with his play on the field. Matt Owens was a huge nightmare. No one could cover this guy. He plays so much higher than his 72 overall. Matt Owens, the River Ridge, Louisiana product. Huge year. 133 receptions. Nearly 1,900 receiving yards. 17 touchdowns, too. He damn near had 2,000 yards on the season. And it was easy to say he was the best receiver in college football, hands down. Now, going on to the John Mackey Award that goes to the best tight end in America. It's going to go to a tight end who was seen as an offensive leader for the Scarlet Knights of Rutgers. David Martin from Trenton, New Jersey, the hometown kid in his last year of college eligibility puts together a season that will not be forgotten uh, in Piscataway, New Jersey anytime soon. The kid ends up with near with over 1,000 receiving yards and 12 touchdowns. He could be the next coming of Gronk if he is given that NFL opportunity. For the Outland Trophy, that goes to one of the best offensive linemen in the country. That will be awarded to Andre Engel this year. The senior redshirt out of Sunrise, Florida, was opening up a breakfast shop down in his hometown because he has a lot of pancakes 63 total pancakes on the year three sacks a wild i'm sure this guy is going to be a surefire first round draft pick he's got a mean streak that every nfl team in the league would love to have in addition because there is a separate award for centers no surprise that andre engel also does end up winning the Remington Award as well because he already has the Best Offensive Lineman Award. So no surprise that he's also considered the best center in the country as well. So it does turn out that John Washington actually does win more than one award because John Washington, not only does he end up winning that Nagurski, that Labrardi Award, he also ends up winning the Nagurski Award as well. So multiple awards for the senior out of Notre Dame to help improve his NFL draft stock as well. Do have a few freshmen on this list and shout outs to those freshmen uh, that did end up uh, competing for the Lombardi Award. But this is John Washington's world and we're just existing in it. For the Buckus Award, this Buckus Award goes to one of the best linebackers in the entire country. And this will be provided by Chris Terrell. Chris Terrell is a junior out of Ontario, Canada. And while his Washington Huskies do end up disappointing in the college football playoff, Chris Terrell certainly lived up to his expectations. He finishes the year with multiple forced fumbles, a defensive touchdown, and eight tackles behind the line of scrimmage. Chris Terrell helped make this Washington front seven one of the best front sevens in the entire country. And the scary part is, he's likely going to come back for his senior year. We'll have to wait and see if that is actually the case or not. Now, we go on to the Jim Forpe Award, which is awarded to one of the best defensive backs in the entire country. And this award for year number three will be provided to Michael Bass, the junior red shirt out of Claremont, California. Spending some time with the California Bears, and this guy was enforcing a no-fly zone. You want to talk about possibly the next Sean Taylor? 
This could be that guy right there. Two sacks, a forced fumble, a defensive touchdown as well. And the fact that he wins this award in spite of only having one interception just lets it be known just how scared other teams are to throw, throw the ball over in Michael Bass's direction. Up next, we have the Lou Groza Award, which goes to the best kicker in the entire country. And this year, it will be given to the senior out of La Massa, Texas, in Victor Kane. He, in his senior year, he played for the Houston Cougars and had an excellent season. Only missed one extra point and was just a constant consistency in the special teams. 24 for 26 from field goals, a long of 51 yards as well. This senior is going to be known as one of the best kickers that Houston has had the opportunity to have on its football team. Now, we go on to the punters, and the punters will be receiving the Ray Guy Award. Going to the best punter in the entire country. And that will be given to Rico Johnson, the senior out of Tifton, Georgia. Uh, Rico Johnson knew how to down punts inside the 20 and knew a thing or two about flipping the field. He averaged almost 43 yards a punt with a long of 55, but, he, but that's not his strength. His strength is his deadly accuracy. 10 of his punts this year were inside the 20 yard line, putting opposing offenses behind the eight ball. So congratulations to Rico Johnson on winning the Ray Guy Award. And finally, the Jet Award goes to the best returnman in college football, and there was no one scarier than Hunter Rice. The sophomore redshirt out of Rain, Louisiana, he had over 1,300 special teams yards. He also had a, a touchdown as well. I believe that was specifically in the punting game. Uh, Hunter Rice, no surprises here. Uh, definitely one of the most deadly return men in all of college football but we do get the opportunity to see one of your guys' custom players make it onto this list as well jody gentry the senior red shirt out of quantico station virginia he also is gonna have a, a say in the matter 1100 return yards and a touchdown as well he was certainly in that conversation to win the jet award even though he didn't end up finishing in 10th place so we took a look at all of the award winners experience in college football this season but now let's go ahead and take a quick look at the all-american list not only for the first and second teams but also who are the best freshmen in the entire country at least the notable freshmen uh that maybe have been one of your guys's custom guys for example well not a lot of surprises on this first team to begin with Fred Morris the fourth is going to be a first team All-American and he did end up winning the O'Brien Award uh, we do also have Trey Dixon in here and Matt Owens who are either award finalists or actually did end up winning award we do have Brandon Henderson in here the senior out of Bryan Texas uh, will be representing strong for the Oklahoma Sooners even though Oklahoma did not have the best of seasons out in the NCSL version of the Big 12. Also, in that first team All American, you got the senior out of Wahina, Hawaii. That is Matt Branch. Uh, very surprised that he has a very uh, generic name for uh, the town that he grew up in, but 1,200 yards and 15 touchdowns. It was considered an excellent season. David Martin, the John Mackey Award winner. He's going to be on your first team All-American list. And a quick look at your offensive line. Quinnen Martinez, the junior red shirt out of Michigan. Andre Engel, who won multiple offensive line awards, including most notably to Remington. Seth Jackson, the senior out of Texas, represented out of Steubenville, Ohio. And rounding out your offensive line, I'm pretty sure is Abraham Pennington, the senior out of Whittier, California. He played for the Washington Huskies and Quinn Jones, the senior, playing for the Michigan Wolverines. Safe to say those that team up north had one of the best offensive lines in the country considering they had three first team All-Americans. Now we'll take a quick look at the defensive side of the ball for the first team All-American list. You got John Washington out of Notre Dame who's won a couple of awards. 
Stanley Jones, the junior out of Miami. Stanley Jones has been a constant presence in this series, uh, winning a couple of awards back in year number one, uh, the Lombardi and the Nagurski, uh, but he hasn't been able to repeat his season one stats. Still a first team All-American though. Jason Thomas, the junior out of Texas. He's uh, from Pampa, Texas, so a home state kid. And rounding out the defensive line for the first team All-Americans is Anthony Tyson, the junior redshirt, uh, playing for the Miami Hurricanes. He's from Raymondville, Texas, uh, and he's considered a run stopper as well. Moving deeper into the front seven, we go to the linebackers. So we got Jamal Cutler, the senior redshirt out of Georgia. He's from Lamnette, Alabama. We also have Jeff Bradley, just a sophomore from Benford Heights, Ohio. Now, Jeff Bradley, he played a lot higher than that 72 overall that he has next to his name. Look at the stats that he put up as a starter. 85 total tackles, 12 assisted tackles as well. He had three interceptions, multiple forced fumbles, and, of course, multiple force reco fumble recoveries as well. Uh, Jeff Bradley, while he's far from a very polished player, and you can see his stats here, uh, Jeff Bradley is the truth and is just one of those guys that plays significantly higher than what his overall says. As for the other offensive lineman, Chris Terrell, who is an award winner, uh, he's a junior out of Washington. Now, for the DBs, we have Steve Coley, the sophomore out of Green Haven, Maryland. Very young kid, uh, but Steve Coley has already proven he's one of the best DBs in the entire country. Maurice Smith has been a more known and, and established corner, though. He's a senior red shirt out of Columbus, Georgia, likely on his way to the NFL. Bryson Miller, the senior red shirt out of Ole Miss, Actually comes all the way from Kodahe, Wisconsin. And if I butchered that, you could let me know in the co uh, comments because I certainly uh, deserved uh, to be roasted for that. Uh, David Flowers, the senior out of Washington as well. We'll round out your DBs. He is a home state kid as well. Now for the special teams guys, Victor Lane, who does uh, win the Lou Garza Award. Uh, he is here as a first team All-American as well. Rico Johnson, who won the Ray Guy Award, is here from Miami. And then Hunter Price, who won the Jet Award, he represents well for the University of Southern Mississippi. Now we move on to the second team, all Americans here. Adam Castillo is going to start the group off. Not a Heisman finalist, but still getting in over the likes of a, uh, like a Kaya Suke Nakamura. Uh, also, uh, like a Marcus Amos, uh, but Adam Castillo had a good season as well. He's a junior red shirt out of Washington. Cable Kurt, the true freshman from Miami, was a Heisman finalist, won the Doug Walker Award as well. He gets second team All-American honors. And then rounding out your running backs is Elliot Hartman, the junior out of Douglasville, Georgia, who plays for the Georgia Bulldogs. Now, moving on to the receivers for the second team All-Americans. You got Brandon Burks, the senior out of Ohio State. Ike James, the junior red shirt out of Western Kentucky. He's a possession archetype from New Holt, North Carolina. Coached by one of your guys' custom coaches, actually, and Doug Rose. And rounding out the receivers is Alan Wright, the senior out of Albertville, Alabama. He's played for the Mississippi State Bulldogs. Up next is the offensive line for your second team All-Americans. We now go to Keith Golden, the senior out of USC, to start off this offensive line. We also have John Johnson, the senior red shirt out of Michigan, representing well for Germantown, Wisconsin. Cedric Hopkins, a junior red shirt out of Texas. Jamie Brooks, the senior out of V. Ohio State. He is a Chandler, Arizona product. Jason Sharp, a senior red shirt out of East Bradenton, Florida. He's from the IMG Academy, I believe. Uh, he played his last year of college football for the Florida State Seminoles, as that will wrap up the offensive side of the ball. Now, for the defensive side of the ball, we have Paul Moore, the sophomore out of USC, who is also your Bragnarik Award winner as well, so a bright future uh, out there on the West Coast. 
Nick Ashley, a true freshman, true dot freshman from Notre Dame gets second team All-American honors. This is a surprise from Marsville, Kentucky. You know, you don't expect many freshmen to start, let alone make the actual All-American list. But Nick Ashley was certainly the exception. 24 TFLs this year. He also had eight sacks, an interception, which is impressive in itself for a defensive lineman, multiple pass breakups, multiple fumbles forced as well. Nick Ashley might be the truth, and Nick Ashley, uh, he might be the next big thing uh, for Notre Dame's defensive line. Now, rounding out that defensive line, we have yet another true freshman, Donnie Jones from Washington. And these true freshmen are built different. Donnie Jones, certainly the case as well. 18 TFLs, 8 sacks, 2 forced fumbles too. Uh, another true freshman on the defensive line, which is absolutely crazy. And then you have another sophomore in Tom Newman who gets second team All-American honors. He's from Colonia, New Jersey. So a very young defensive line uh, for the second team All-Americans. All of them are underclassmen. Same cannot be said for the linebackers, though, as Andre Lewis wins the uh, second team All-American honors at the middle linebacker position. Uh, the Notre Dame product uh, is from San Sun Prairie, Wisconsin. And then your other linebackers, again, a true freshman. A lot of true freshmen on this list. I uh, feel like it's pretty clear to see uh, what that freshman All-American list is going to be looking like. Uh, but Reggie Allen out of Morrisville, North Carolina, really shined for the Crimson Tide. Was not expected to start this season, but an injury forced him into the starting lineup. And he shined in the opportunity. Nearly double-digit tackles. He had 90 total tackles on the year. Two sacks, an interception, um, two forced fumbles, four fumble recoveries too. So Reggie Allen's just a guy that simply flew all over the field. And then to wrap things up, you have Chris Russell V. Jr. out of Saginaw, Texas. Another case of playing higher than your overall. Uh, this is his second year starting as, as a true freshman. He sparingly saw the field, mainly in blowouts, but... Starting to catch up to the speed of college football, and that showed with the second team designation. 84 tackles, 4 sacks, that is a career high as well. Uh, 2 forced fumbles, and a fumble recovery as well, uh, plus a few pass deflections. Uh, other than the tackles, I feel like someone else might have been able to get into that right uh, outside linebacker spot, but the voters that vote on these types of things, well, he, they respectfully disagreed with my assessment. For the corners, we got Slare, Terrence Clemens, the senior red shirt out of Wheeling, Illinois. He played his uh, college football uh, uh, at Nebraska. Anthony Rogers, the another senior red shirt out of Conway, Florida, who did end up playing for the Florida Gators. Grant Wiley, the senior red shirt out of Alabama who plays uh, from South Lake, Texas. And then the sophomore, Avery Hudson, a sophomore out of Camarillo, California. Another youngster making this All-American list. A guy that also flew all over the field. While he didn't get the chance to sack the quarterback yet again, he improved his stats across the board, including four interceptions and a forced fumble as well. So a significant step up from his true freshman season but he has been a starter since day one and then you got your special teams guys marcus dotson who was a true freshman at florida very good season 19 for 22 uh his longest field goal was from 52 yards as well so he's got a boot on him and he has that accuracy as well and accuracy is harder to teach than uh, having a stronger leg, you want a stronger leg, you got to go into the weight room, but, you know, having a more accurate leg, that's from hard work and dedication, and Marcus Dotson certainly has that, Zach Riley, the senior, you could say the same thing about him, the El Cajon California product, uh, punting extremely well for the Michigan Wolverines, and finally, rounding out your second team All-American list is Andy Curtis, the senior redshirt out of Cosa Mecca, California. Andy Curtis, 
uh, had an excellent season uh, in that special teams and also had a chance to touch the ball quite a bit as well. He had over 1,300 yards rushing and 19 rushing touchdowns. So real quick before I end up advancing through the regular season, I want to take a chance to take a quick look at if there's any notable uh, freshmen that are on this list. We do know about Caleb Kirk who did win multiple awards uh, and is an All-American uh, just in general. We do have one of your guys' custom, uh, one of the guys that are coached, but one of your guys' custom coaches, uh, Doug Rose, he got a tight end in there in Mike Hall. True freshman out of Western Kentucky. First of all, he has a 69 overall, and we all know that's very nice. Uh, but Mike Hall put together a great season. 50 catches, 812 yards, 7 touchdowns as well. Uh, courtesy of Doug Rose, uh, putting together a great scheme to really maximize the talents that Mike Hall might have. Uh, he might be a little bit of a diamond of of the rough checking around real quick to see if there's any other freshmen of note that could possibly uh be on this list and it looks like i don't see any uh freshmen of the oh hang on now wait a minute we do have another custom recruit in here joseph shabazz harris the freshman out of greenwood village colorado joseph shabazz man he played an extraordinarily high level stepping in on a national championship defender while his usc trojans didn't make the playoffs he shined in his role as a starter from day one 50 total tackles on the year he got two interceptions as well five pass breakups to go with it too this is a kid that i would expect to see in the nfl as soon as year number five he might only be in uh at usc for three years tops and that's it but this is going to wrap up the all americans both of the first and second team variety and of course your freshman all american list as well so now we get to the coaching carousel and the coaching carousel has always been the most intriguing for me personally and what we'll go ahead and do during the course of this coaching carousel is we're going to take a look at all of the new hand coaches and then if there's also any moves specific to your guys's custom coaches as well we will go ahead and take a look at that as well so the first job that does end up opening up for alabama is this alabama job jim knowles did end up retiring and alabama did finish with a very good season ends up going nine and four and that will be given actually going to stay in house Gwen schumann who was a defensive coordinator for the crimson tide last year well now he is going to be the new head coach and this is a guy that went to get his undergraduate at alabama as well so uh glenn schumann will give him the best of luck we'll see if he can stay uh keep alabama in the upper tiers of college football but the next head coaching job that is up next and this one's going to be a little bit more difficult is uh the pittsburgh job uh Ke kenny dillingham was fired after he did end up failing to meet his goals and the head coaching job goes to the offensive coordinator out of army mike yursich he led the Army Black Knights to an undefeated season, a Conference USA Championship, and of course a trip to the college football playoff as well before losing to Ohio State in the quarterfinal. He's a Pittsburgh grad, and now he'll be tasked to get Pittsburgh back on the right track. Speaking of trying to get a team back on the right track, Texas A&M, they have been down horrendous. And Jeff Trailer was the coach here he's not being fired he's going to retire instead a tall task in building this texas a&m program right back up we'll see who will get that texas a&m job as there is multiple options that are that are actually out there but we'll see who ends up getting it and it's going to be the offensive coordinator out of ucla that is sean lewis his offense helped ucla win a national championship in year number three and now he'll cash that in with a head coaching job at a university that has the resources to win but they have been down since the start of the ncsl dynasty 
Now we see the Mississippi State job open up and Chuck Martin, he has retired from coaching at the age of 67. Mississippi State, a very good program. And that's going to go to Lee Kentrell, the former defensive coordinator out of Texas, saying, uh, out of Texas, Texas nearly winning a national championship, falling just short in that national championship game. Lee Kentrell will now continue to build upon the success that has been established here at the University of Mississippi State. Up next, we have Matt House being fired by the Michigan State Star Spartans. So now we will see this Michigan State job officially open up. We'll see who will end up getting that Michigan State job as they'll contact multiple candidates before settling on a rival. Wow. So they go to their rival in defensive coordinator Patrick Harris, who is at Michigan. Wow. So Patrick Harris must have really wanted that promotion to go to his rival school to be a head coach. That is insane. But congratulations to Patrick Harris on getting that head coaching's job at Mich Michigan State. Meanwhile, Shannon Moore of Arizona was fired after a 4-8 and eight season. And we'll look to see who those candidates are to try and uh, get that job. Looking around, they will contact a lot of different coaches, actually, before the defensive coordinator out of Ohio State. And Patrick Tony finally accepts the job. He's an LSU alumni. It's a very interesting hire because he doesn't have a lot of background out in the West Coast, but he does have a very good X's and O's in this defense, and that is desperately needed at Arizona in order to be competitive again in the Mountain West. But Chad Staggs clearly did not work out. I believe it was literally last season where South Carolina hired themselves a new head coach. Well, it literally did not work at all. Chad Staggs was not the guy after all. They fire him after one season, and once again, they will look for a new head coach to try and turn South Carolina around. South Carolina is not a 2-10 time program. And now the defensive coordinator out of Georgia in Chris Hampton will now try to turn South Carolina around. This is a Georgia team that did win the SEC, went to the college football playoff, and Chris Hampton, not only a solid X's and O's guy, but he's also an alumni from South Carolina as well. So a huge pickup for South Carolina. Hopefully this second time is a much better coaching tenure than what we saw out of Chad Staggs. At Western Kentucky though, Bill Bush uh, has retired and Western Kentucky had a very good season actually. Uh, Bill Bush uh, led the Helltoppers to a seven and six overall record but a new head coach will be coming in. It will be the defensive coordinator out of California, Joe Gillespie, California, one of the best teams that did not make the college football playoff this year. So this will be a huge pickup as Western Kentucky will be bringing that air raid uh, back. He is a Texas Tech alumni as well. We'll see if Doug Rose is retained on the staff or not. Moving on now, we have the Cincinnati Bearcats. Tim Banks horrifically failed at Cincinnati. Had his team in some close games, but close only counts in horseshoes, hand grenades, and nuclear missiles. So now Cincinnati needs a new head coach. And interesting enough, Coach Willie Hammock Jr. does get offered the head coaching job at Cincinnati. However, he also gets an extension offer from Northern Illinois. And Willie Hammock Jr. actually is from Northern Illinois. He's a Northern Illinois alumni. His dad actually was the head coach at NIU. So that being said, all of those being considered, while Thomas Hammock Jr. has a chance to become the offensive coordinator or the head coach at Cincinnati, what he's actually going to do is he's going to sign back up to be the offensive coordinator once again. He is going to stay at Northern Illinois. So, who ends up filling this Cincinnati head coaching job after all? 
who will get that type of opportunity? Well, the head coach out of Ball State, Benny Martin. No, it's Scott Wofer. Wow, I thought they went with a completely different person. We got bamboozled there. But Scott Wofer had Rice very close to going to the Big 12 Championship the last couple of years. He will now get a head coaching opportunity up in Cincinnati. And he's familiar with the area as well. He is from the University of Michigan where he went and got his undergrad. But speaking of that Midwestern part of the country, we now look at what Michigan, or not Michigan, Louisville is going to need. And George Gentry is one of the top candidates. I don't think he will accept this job because um, he got an extension offer from Nebraska. And this team is very close to winning a national championship. Just in the last three years, 12-2, 12-2, and, and then an 11-4, Two of those ending in conference championships also went to the quarterfinal of the college football playoff, pulled that upset against Tennessee. So George Gentry feels like he is very close to winning a national championship and doesn't feel like it's right for him to go be a head coach just yet. So George Gentry is going to decline this offer. He's going to remain at Nebraska. But who does go for that job? It's going to be Al Golden, the defensive coordinator from Notre Dame. He was under the last year of his contract anyways. Um, he knows this team. Notre Dame is in the same conference as Louisville. So he goes from a team that was very close to winning the MAC this year and ends up winning their bowl game to now arguably one of the worst teams in the country in a rebuild that will be required. So Jake Jankums did do some excellent work in his two years as the defensive coordinator at TCU. And Jake Jankums, he also wants an opportunity to actually compete. The offense was not there at TCU, but Jake Jankums gets offered a contract to be the defensive coordinator at the University of Georgia. And at Georgia, it is a constant winner. Uh, Four, five of their last six seasons, they have finished with double-digit wins. Last two years alone, they ended up winning the SEC Championship. This is a great opportunity for Jake Jacobs as he continues to work closer to possibly being a head coach one day. He will go to one of the best def uh, defenses in the country. And this Georgia team is going to be coming back with a lot of talent as well. So a great move for Jake Jacobs overall. And then Remy Natalius. He's another coordinator that is certainly getting some attention from bigger schools. And there certainly is a bigger school that could certainly use his help. Oregon finishes below 500 even though they ended up being uh, preseason ranked in the top 25. A big reason for that is Oregon. They certainly need some offensive help. Remy Natalius might certainly be that guy as Oregon is has been on a downhill spiral since year number one. They won 10 games in year one, then went eight and five. Now they went five and seven. They need someone to really help turn this thing around. And Remy Natalius might be that guy that is ready for the challenge. So Remy Natalius welcome to the university of oregon we also have a new head coach and after indiana went 0 and 12 it looks like that entire coaching staff is going to be dramatically different scott schaefer instead of being fired he gets the opportunity to retire so he does that a little bit more graceful so to speak we will have a new head coach in Kenny Din Dillingham. Uh, he's going to be on a five-year contract. Uh, was the head coach at Pittsburgh before he got fired from there as well. We'll see if he can do a better job at Indiana, but is not looking good. Georgia State is also going to need a head coach as well. We'll see who Georgia State ends up hiring. They get the offensive coordinator out of Southern Miss, Sean Elliott, from a very good Southern Miss team that went eight and five uh, knows the area pretty well overall so that could help Georgia State uh, get things going on the right track once again he's also an Appalachian State alumni there too 
Washington State needs a head coach. As Kirk uh, Kuriaka, he does retire at the ripe old age of 70. Doug Rose is offered this position. Um, but Doug Rose doesn't feel like this is the, the greatest of fits here either and he feels like that there's more to this western kentucky team so instead of doug rose accepting the head coaching position at washington state he is actually going to stay with the hilltoppers and we'll see who washington state actually hires they are the head coach out of chad stags which is not a very inspiring hire in my opinion the dude just went two and ten in a place where he had more resources than he will have at Washington State. So it's a little bit of a head scratcher in my opinion. But hey, it's their football program. They can do what they want from it. Hopefully Chat and Stag can take some of those hard lessons that he learned in South Carolina and do better here at Washington State. So Northwestern ended up uh, needing a new head coach as the previous head coach actually was hired by Hawaii to be the new defensive coordinator and a younger person that is going to take the mantle colin klein he was the offensive coordinator at houston solid year for the houston cougars went six and six uh this is a guy that if his name sounds familiar uh he was actually a heisman finalist uh when he played quarterback at kansas state he's going to try to revitalize this northwestern program We'll see if he's up to the challenge as this will be his very first head coaching opportunity. Utah State, meanwhile, was also in a position of needing a new head coach after a tumultuous 1-11 campaign that also saw the previous head coach leave in order to be hired as the offensive coordinator at Colorado State within the same conference, by the way. So they will now turn to Travis Trinket an offensive coordinator from Louisiana Tech to try to get Utah State back in the right direction. At 1-11, though, that will certainly be a challenge. It might be a school that will be available for those of you that are looking to enter the coaching ranks by filling out a coach custom coach template. Something to keep an eye out there. Meanwhile, Marcus Satterfield, after taking Akron to a bowl game in year number two, well, he gets fired after going 1-11 in the following season. He has found a new job already as the offensive coordinator at Michigan State, but the new head coach at Akron is going to be Brian Hodge, who actually did not coach last year. So, good luck to Brian Hodge. Uh, he is an alumni from Miami, not very familiar with the area certainly not a very inspiring hire here uh, made by the akron zips but akron is certainly not the only team that is considered at the bottom of the barrel though uh uab is also in that same position not able to win a single game here in year number three as well so uab uh, we might not see them in a conference this year. Tough times to be lived for sure. Um, but that being said, UAB in the meantime is still going to need a new coach. And because of that, what we will do is we will now see who will get that head coaching opportunity. And it's going to be Jeff Braun, who is the offensive coordinator at Charlotte. Got fired from Charlotte as an offensive coordinator so again not a great hire uh for uab but sometimes you just gotta take uh what you can get hopefully jeff brom can turn his career around but it's not going to be easy but one of the more difficult parts of any offseason is to say goodbye to some notable players uh that you know played big roles for their respective teams starting with the players that are foregoing at least one year of college eligibility in order to pursue their professional dreams and going for the more notable players joel daniels the junior out of ohio state he'll forgo his senior year as he is projected to be a second round pick in the upcoming nfl draft among potential fourth round picks so this is the start of day number three you got sheldon benson the junior out of lsu he plays the free safety position brad wood the junior redshirt out of ohio state playing at uh wide receiver david massey the junior redshirt out of texas he was actually the backup running back was supposed to be the starter instead gonna chase those nfl dreams johnny branch another texas kid a true junior 
playing at tight end. So Texas losing quite a bit of talent off of a team that was very close to winning a national championship. Now, for the fifth round picks, we got Dominic Hawley, a junior out of Clemson, who played at the running back position. Tyler Montgomery, the junior redshirt out of Ohio State, a very strong offensive lineman for the Buckeyes that will not be there. Eric Archie, the quarterback at Ole Miss. He's a, a uh, junior red shirt. Lionel Sanders, a junior red shirt out of Arkansas that plays that tight end position. Adam Castillo, a second team All-American. Will forgo his senior year. He was a quarterback at Washington, and this will be a massive loss. Craig Grave, a junior redshirt out of Arkansas State. He will also forgo his eligibility. A strong offensive lineman for the Red Wolves. And now we start with the six round picks that are declaring, at least as of note. Christian Martinez, a junior redshirt out of Cal. He was a leader at the quarterback position. Chauncey Richardson, junior redshirt out of Nevada. This is a big loss for the Wolf Pack. Is they don't have the innate ability to replace talent like some of the other schools do. Bo Folks, a junior out of Ole Miss, playing at the free safety position. Jake Kaysen, the junior redshirt out of Arkansas, plays at middle linebacker. Jay King, the junior redshirt out of Texas A&M. Uh, he is going to be missed for sure. And then rounding out your players that are foregoing their last year of eligibility, you got Brian Goins out of Miami of Ohio, Sean Rivera out of UCLA, and that will round out your top guys that are declaring for the NFL draft at least one year early. Now, there usually isn't a ton happening in the transfer portal, but at the same time though, I do have a couple of your custom guys that are actually entering the transfer portal. Cody Kensor II, a guy that was redshirted this past year, well, he doesn't want to wait any longer. So he is going to enter the transfer portal. He will find a new home for the Arizona Wildcats. While this does mean he has to sit out for year number four, and your number five, Arizona, will have their quarterback of the future. And then also, Vinny Midnight, who played sparingly for North Carolina this past year, uh, actually was able to find the end zone two this year at one point. Well, he feels like he's in a log jam at North Carolina, so he's not going to be there anymore. He will go to South Alabama. Big pickup for the South Alabama Jaguars as they pick up a former four-star kid. Uh, Vinny Midnight also will have to sit out here in your number four. But while there are some players that are going to be leaving through the transfer portal or through the NFL draft, there also were a few surprises in terms of guys that are staying a little bit longer than anticipated. Michael Bass is one of those guys. He's a junior red shirt out of Cal. He won the Jim Forpay Award. He's going to be back for his senior year. Thomas Whitworth, the junior red shirt out of Duke. Very good offensive lineman to help protect the backside for the Blue Devils because they have a left-handed quarterback, I do believe. Uh, Thomas Whitworth is also staying for his senior year. Same will be said for Brian Holman, the corner out of Michigan. Aaron Downs, another Michigan skill player. He's staying for his senior year as well. Will Selipak, the a guy who was very close, and I mean extremely close, to getting to the leader of interceptions, Will Selipak, ladies and gentlemen, staying for his senior year, and that's one of your guys' customs as well. But now, let's go ahead and jump into each position real fast in order to take a look at some of the notable players that are going to the NFL Draft, looking at those first-round guys. So at the quarterback position, we actually do have a couple of guys uh, in the quarterback position that are projected to go in round number one. FM4, which is no surprise, he is a projected first round pick. Alongside the senior redshirt Chase Ingram, the Prairington, Texas quarterback, nearly led the Longhorns to a national championship. And running back, meanwhile, there is a deeper stable of talent at the running back position, one of which is Maurice Hall, the senior out of Michigan, Trey Dixon out of Texas, and Jake Cook out of UCLA is your 
notable running backs coming into the NFL draft for year number three. But at wide receiver, there is even more depth at the wide receiver position for first round caliber players. Matt Branch out of Michigan. William Butler out of Nebraska. He was coached by the custom coach George Gentry. Brandon Burks out of Ohio State. And then also Rob Townsend, a senior out of UCLA. Meanwhile, for the tight ends, we actually just have the one tight end, and that's it. We do have Michael Bryant out of Georgia. He is the consensus best tight end in this particular draft class in year number three. At the left tackle position, the best left tackle in the NCSL was Keith Golden. He's the only left tackle with first round considerations as of right now. Left guard is a lot of the same thing as only one first round caliber left guard. That is AJ Cronin out of Maryland. He's a Waynesboro, Pennsylvania kid. At the center position, even though we don't have any first round caliber players, we do have a former FCS player in here though. Ronnie Lewis, the transfer out of Texas Southern, played his senior year at Tennessee, and his team able to win a MAC championship, go to the playoff, and he's going to be projected to go in the sixth round of the NFL draft. Not bad for somebody that started out in the lower level of Division I football. And then rounding out the offensive side of the football, we do have two first round caliber players uh, at this right tackle position. Jason Sharp out of scene, uh, Florida State and Quinn Jones, who is also a senior out of the University of Michigan. Plus, on top of that, we do have two FCS transfers that were able to mold themselves into NFL prospects as well. Jason Smith, for example, he was a transfer out of Weber State, transferred here as a graduate uh, transfer, played at Virginia Tech, and had a good enough year to be a fourth-round projected pick. And then going in round five possible, you have Jared Cumby, who played as a grad transfer at Baylor. He spent his first four years at Southeast Missouri State, and he is now projected to go in the fifth round of the NFL draft. But now we start with the defensive players, and going to the defensive side of the ball, we have the defensive line. Two first-round players reside here in Marcus Jenkins out of Baylor. And we also have Patrick Wester out of Augusta, Georgia. He played for the Georgia Tank Yellow Jackets. On the opposite side, though, you got Kenny Peterson out of LSU. And you also have Ethan McNeil out of Tulane uh, getting a little bit of love as well as a first-round pick. And then plugging up the middle, you'll have three first-round prospects in Ben Knox out of LSU. Jelani Matthews, who is also from LSU as well, the best uh, one-two punch uh, in the country. And Preston Martinez out of Rutgers. Meanwhile, at the middle linebacker position, Jonathan Archie, even though he finishes the year injured, Jonathan Archie is still going to be a first-round pro uh, projection uh, up at the NFL. The same thing could also be said for Mike Goodman out of Penn State and Antoine Chambers out of USC. Finally making the jump to the NFL. Could have made it last year if he wanted to. But now we go over to the DBs and we have three first round DBs just at the cornerback position alone. That's Maurice Smith out of Georgia, Mike Payne out of Michigan, and then also Terrence Clemens out of Nebraska as well for the free safeties we do also have matt brady out of university of nebraska he is actually the top free safety in this nfl draft class and then rounding out the defensive side of the ball we do have david flowers the senior out of washington shout out to joe Brunkstow, the senior out of buffalo um he was also an fcs transfer as well He's going to be a second round pick too. So, you know, the highest drafted FCS player, uh, or at least former FCS player that we see from this NCSL dynasty. But we are officially here on the signing day and slash recruiting portion of the NCSL offseason. And I want to take a moment to take a look at this top 25 in recruiting rankings, as well as some other 
notable recruiting rankings uh, from this year. So Ohio State was able to sign the number one class this year. And Ohio State, they are very close to being a national champion the last two years. They were a runner-up in year number two. They ended up going to the semifinals here in year number three. So they're very close to winning a national championship. They're right there. USC, your champions of year number two, well, they signed the second best recruiting class. They narrowly missed out on the college football playoff this year, though. Michigan, same thing for the Wolverines. Barely missed, but they signed a top five class. Texas, your runners up in this year, finishing number two overall. They signed the number four class. And then you have Navy, who finishes in the top five. Georgia, your champions of the SEC, finish in number six. They were knocked in the first round by Ole Miss. Nebraska ends up signing the number seven recruiting class in America. A very solid class. No top flight guys, per se. No five-star players. But it doesn't stop Nebraska from signing the seventh best class. They were able to make it to the quarterfinals this year. Washington ranked number one in the country for much of the year the washington huskies well they had a disappointing college football playoff losing in the quarterfinals to old miss you also have minnesota at number nine florida state at number 10 they made it to the quarterfinals as well uh getting dropped ultimately by your national champions in ucla speaking of those bruins we see where our national champions end up UCLA ends up signing the number 11 recruiting class in all of college football. Getting down to the second half of the top 25, you got Nevada at 12, Army at 13, the Military Academy had the free seed in the college football playoff, losing to Army, but they are your champions of the Conference USA. Nonetheless, San Diego State finishing as a top 25 team, also doing so in the recruiting rankings able to leverage that Southern California lever to get the 14th best recruiting class. Miami finishes number 15 and as a top 10 team overall, narrowly missing out on the playoffs. Stanford missing a bowl game, but they are looking to bounce back as the 16th best recruiting class. Oregon State also missed out on bowl action. They finished number 17. At number 18, you have LSU, uh, who ends up winning their bowl game and finishing as a top 20 team in the country, followed by Auburn, who was not in a bowl game, but they do uh, still finish in the top 25. Nonetheless, Alabama, they finished number 20 in recruiting and as a top 25 team as well, narrowly beating Nevada in a very tightly contested bowl game. Rutgers. Losing in the Conference USA Championship, uh, I believe, to the Army. Uh, but Rutgers does finish with the 21st best recruiting class. Texas A&M looking to bounce back after two putrid seasons. They do put together a top 25 class. And rounding out your top 25 is Oregon, who misses out on a bowl game. Georgia State, in spite of finishing 1-11. and and Ole Miss, who did make it to the college football playoff, making it all the way to the semifinals this year. They were your Cinderella. A few more programs of note in here. Tennessee finishes with the 52nd best recruiting class in the entire country. And they do so being champions of the MAC conference this year. Virginia Tank is your champions of the ACC, and they do so uh, with the 71st recruiting class in the country, so might have to leverage that development a little bit more. And of course, the Mountain West champions, the Colorado Buffaloes, uh, finished with a respectable 8-6 record. They finished with the 77th overall recruiting class. And of course, for pure giggles, we wanted to see who had the worst recruiting class in the entire country. It belongs to the winless Indiana Hoosiers, uh, who only end up signing three three-star players and 18 total players out of their recruiting class. Indiana is a little bit down horrendous right about now. But now taking a look at a little bit of a breakdown of how uh, each uh, individual position went down. Starting with the most important position on the field, and that is that quarterback position. This year, the number one quarterback was Clifford Smith, 
a scrambler out of Key West, Florida. Here's a guy that did end up having only two scholarships out on the West Coast, UCLA and USC. Well, he wants to go to USC at the end of the day. Should be a massive add to add on to the quarterback tradition that is at the University of Southern California. As for the number one running one running back in America, wow, that's a tongue twister. Uh, Jason Evans is the number one running back in high school football this year. From Elizabeth City, North Carolina, he is actually going to leave the state of North Carolina to play for the Tennessee Volunteers. It was actually surprisingly the only scholarship offer he received. He's going to be looking to prove a lot of people wrong with his stature being below six foot but he does have some tremendous ability as a balanced running back. For the fullback position, the fullbacks is a dying breed, but don't tell that to these kids. Doug Harrison is your number one fullback from Columbine, Colorado. He's actually going to stay in the state of Colorado to play with the Buffaloes, who are coming off of a Mountain West championship as well as a college football playoff appearance to go with that as well uh he had some interest as well from nebraska but colorado is where he ultimately wanted to be now for the wide receiver position the number one wide receiver was chad london out of forest park G georgia he was a balanced receiver with a spark rating of 94.2 Chad London, he had some significant interest from multiple programs, TCU and Northern Illinois to go with it, but he wanted to go to one of the best wide receiver schools in the entire country in the Ohio State Buckeyes, and he looks to join that amazing wide receiver room, hopefully putting that team over the top to win a national championship. As for the number one tight end in the country, he is from Bay City, Michigan. It is Ed Savoy, who is more known for his blocking than receiving the football, but still pretty quick at 4'7". Ed Savoy is going to Stanford, but this was an insane recruiting battle. Northwestern, Michigan State, and Auburn all really wanted this kid but Stanford is going to win a tightly contested recruiting battle as Ed Savoy will be donning the Stanford Cardinal jersey for his next four to five years, hopefully. Now, going over to the offensive line and specifically over to the tackles, how about this for a surprise? Andrew Stratton, the five-star tackle out of Urbana, Ohio. Well, he's the only five-star tackle in this recruiting class, and Andrew Stratton's going to Ohio, not Ohio State, not any big school, but Ohio. And boy, were there a lot of schools interested in this kid. Miami of Ohio, Notre Dame, Bowling Green, Ball State, all really wanted a chance at this kid. Michigan State and West Kentucky showed some interest as well, but really tight recruiting battle. Ohio does ultimately win, and they are going to have someone to protect the blind side for a very long time to come but now we go to those interior offensive linemen and how about the eloy arizona product in terrence king terrence king is going to go to usc he did have multiple scholarship offers to texas michigan and ohio state as well this is the second number one prospect that usc has been able to grab and so usc is looking to retool to try to get back into that college football playoff once again here in year number four that's coming up very soon but then you got the centers to round out your offensive line and another small school able to win here Darnell Thomas a run blocking center from Mascope Park New York well he Sovereign Miss is gonna go up north and actually win this kid and there was some a lot some significant interest throughout the country Boston College, Mississippi State, and Memphis. They were all in a recruiting battle with this guy, but Southern Miss is able to win out. It's able to take advantage of the nice weather down south, as well as the good football that's being played at Southern Miss right about now. But now we go over to the defensive side of the football, and this is a big win for the Oregon Ducks. Going into Washington and snagging one of the best players in the state of Washington to go with it as well. Micah Hart, he is a balanced defensive lineman. And this is a kid that surprisingly had no interest from Washington. This is the only scholarship offer that he got from or uh, from the Oregon Ducks. 
so he is going to be an Oregon Duck and looking to be an instant impact player for that Oregon Ducks defense that desperately needs some playmakers. Now at defensive tackle, looking to plug up any interior run games for the next four to five years is John Pierce out of Forest City, North Carolina. John Pierce is going to the Ohio State University as the second number one prospect that the Ohio State Buckeyes have received. Eastern Carolina was also surprisingly enough in this battle and they were hoping that he would stay in the state of North Carolina to play his college football, but John Pierce just wanted to play for a big time program and he's certainly getting that with this Ohio State football team. Now at outside linebacker, the only outside linebacker with a five star designation then is Darius Fisher out of North Cannon, Ohio. However, he's not staying in the Midwest to play his college football. He's actually going to Nevada to play for the Wolfpack, a picking over Indiana and UCLA for his athletic scholarship. A big pickup for the Nevada Wolfpack as they're looking to improve their roster a little bit more as the Pac-12 continues to be one of the most treacherous conferences in all of college football. Now, moving on to the middle linebacker position, and Auburn finally gets involved. Damn Daniels. He's going to go to Auburn. The Camp Springs, Maryland product had multiple scholarship offers uh, in the area, actually. Old Dominion, Maryland, James Madison. They all really wanted this kid to remain at home, but William Daniels, he wanted to play in the Southeast and play in one of the best conferences in all his college football. Auburn is going to snag William Daniels, and that will be a massive abuse. Who's looking to get an instant starter uh, at the linebacker position in what is a very physical conference. Up next, we have the corners, and we actually don't have any five-star corners in this year's recruiting class, but there's still some very good corners in here. However, the best corner in, co in high school football, though, is Leslie Perry, the four-star out of Lakeland, North Washington. Well, he's going to go all the way across the country to play for that team up north in the Michigan Wolverines. He also had scholarship offers as well to Ohio State and Georgia, but the 166-pound corner chose to play for the Wolverines to try to get the Michigan squad back into the college football playoff. Up next, we have the free safeties, and Matt King is the number one free safety in the country from Winder, Georgia. Matt King is going to go to Ohio State, another Ohio State commit here. Looks like Ohio State, really easy to see why they have the number one recruiting class after all. This is our third number one prospect that they end up signing, and it was an intense recruiting battle too. Eastern Carolina, Mid-Tennessee State, Michigan, Memphis, Miami. They all wanted this kid on top of Tennessee, showing a little bit of interest as well. But the Ohio State Buckeyes went out here as well. It looks like Matt King has the potential to be a day one starter for a major college football program as well. Rounding out the skill positions, we have Alex Hallway. He ends up being the number one strong safety in the country from Mishawaka, Indiana, though. But he's not staying in the state of Indiana to play his college football, though, because he is going down south to play for the Crimson Tide of Alabama. He's certainly a thumper, and he's going to come with a chip on his shoulder as well, as he had no other scholarship offers to his name. So before I end up showing who ends up being that um, that number one prospect, oh, we actually, uh, well, we actually kind of spoiled it right there. Uh, so Bo Robinson actually was the number one prospect in the country, it turns out. I didn't realize that until now. But Bo Robinson from Aldine, Texas, he's going to sign with the Missouri Tigers, number one athlete and the number one overall prospect. But Missouri, the only team that was surprisingly showing any sort of interest. So... Great signing for the Missouri Tigers. And then real quick, we'll also check in on the kickers and punters. Jeremy Goddard, he's going to Houston. And Houston just had the Lou Garza Award uh, on their team last year. So Goddard, while the number one kicker in high school, will have some massive shoes to fill. He will also see Trey Wallace, the number one punter in high school, go to Southern Mississippi. This is the second number one prospect that... Southern Miss has been able to sign. Trey Wallace is a native of Laurel, Mississippi. 
But this will about wrap things up here for the offseason recap. Next episode, we will have the season preview of year number four. We'll kind of go uh, conference by conference to see who would be the favorites to win each conference as well as that preseason top 25 plus of course those preseason all americans as well but if you made it this far into the video then i have something important to tell you you could be more in uh eh, infinitely involved uh in the series you just got if you want to do one of two things you could either be a custom player and we'll be able to track through your college career regardless of whether you become uh, into the NCSL as a high school senior or as a JUCO transfer or you could even be a custom coach start out as one of these smaller schools and try to work your way up into one of the top programs in the country if either of those things interest you in any way shape or form all you have to go ahead and do is check out both templates that will be linked not only in the description but also as a pinned comment as well this is also where you'll find your guys's custom stats in your number three so if that excites you in any way shape or form make sure you go ahead and check that out and if you enjoy the entirety of this off-season recap you guys go ahead and do me a massive favor hit that like button and then also hit that subscribe button as well if you do happen to be brand new to the channel this is john j gaming on the mic signing off i'm hoping you guys are all out there having a good one take care everybody